particularly for those of you who are coming to this class for the first time. Um, I think there are one or two people who, didn't, who were not here last time. Uh, I do have the video posted of the previous lecture. Um, as I do this, I am hoping I'm going to get better at shooting them. Um, I seem to have aimed like kind of like directly at the back of my head uh, for most of the last one, um, which is, you know, it's really difficult to watch the back of your own head and say, oh man, I should have done a better job brushing my hair this morning. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it, it's a painful experience. It makes me a little self-conscious, but um, yeah, it's, it's there, it's posted. If you, you do a YouTube search, Michael Moyer, Georgia Southwestern, the video will pop up. Um, this one should be up also within 24 hours. Um, if you need it for whatever reason. Uh, so, let's talk about Gilgamesh. How'd this go for you? What'd you think? Have any, are any of you familiar with Gilgamesh? Have any of you had any experience with, the, okay, you are familiar with Gilgamesh. Anybody else? Anybody else know anything at all about, okay, you two. All right, so those of you who know Gilgamesh, what do you know about Gilgamesh? And where did you learn it? I know where you learned it. You learned it from me. Actually, I knew about it before. Okay. <laughs> then, forgive me for being self-congratulatory. I read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say, Zach? I read a lot of mythologies and stuff like that. Okay. Awesome. So, what do you guys know about Gilgamesh, then? What do you guys already know about Gilgamesh? He's a king. Yeah. Okay, he's a king. He is indeed that. What else? He is, yeah, demigod is one word for it, right? It's probably about the best word for it we have. Um, he is actually two-thirds divine, one-third human. I have no idea how the math on that is actually supposed to work out, um, but there you go. Most of us, you know, have only two parents. <laughs> okay, what else do we know about Gilgamesh? He's an asshole. <laughs> okay, <laughs> at, least, at least initially, yeah. Gil Gilgamesh is a jerk, right? What is Gilgamesh's behavior like at the beginning of the epic? I mean, he's a spoiled, one of the spoiled the right term, but he's very arrogant and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is arrogant. Spoiled is probably actually not a bad word for it. I mean, you know, a spoiled person is someone who gets whatever the hell they want, right? Yeah. And he does seem to get whatever the hell he wants. If we look on page 39, he was perfection in height, ideally handsome. In the enclosure of Uruk, he strode back and forth, lording it like a wild bull, his head thrust high. The onslaught of his weapons had no equal. His teammates stood forth by his game stick. He was harrying the young men of Uruk beyond reason. So he's bigger and better looking than anybody else. Right? In part, perhaps, due to his, you know, divine parentage. And when he's harrying the young men of Uruk beyond reason, right? Gilgamesh would leave no son to his father. Day and night he would rampage fiercely. We don't really know what's meant by the whole making his teammates stand by his game stick thing. We, it sounds like there's you know, some sport that Gilgamesh is really good at, that he forces all of the other men in the city to play with him all the time. It could also be a metaphor for war. Whatever it is, he's clearly very energetic and very aggressive. And... No one around him really feels like they can say no when he tells them to do something. <coughs> this was the shepherd of Rampart and Uruk. This was the people's shepherd, bold, superb, accomplished, and mature. Gilgamesh would leave no girl to her mother. The warrior's daughter, the young man's spouse. Goddesses kept hearing their plaints. So apart from forcing the young men to do whatever it is he's forcing the young men to do, what is he doing to the young women? Them. Basically, yes. Yes, he is forcing himself on them as well. And because we're, you know, dealing with an ancient world despotism here, no one really has the power to say no. And even if someone did take it upon themselves to say no, 
why are they likely to fail? Yeah. There's nobody who can take him down. He is the biggest and the strongest and the fastest. Nobody can beat him. So the gods of heaven, the lords who command, said to Anu, You created this headstrong wild bull and ramparted Uruk. The onslaught of his weapons has no equal. His teammates stand forth by his game stick. He is harrying the young men of Uruk beyond reason. Gilgamesh leaves no son to his father. Day and night he rampages fiercely. This is the shepherd of ramparted Uruk. This is the people's shepherd, bold, superb, accomplished, and mature. Gilgamesh leaves no girl to her mother. This whole thing about being the people's shepherd. What's going on here? This is the people's shepherd. Why do they keep referring to him as the people's shepherd? Well, don't shepherds kind of herd sheep together? So isn't he doing the same yeah. sense? In a way, he is. Yeah, he's, he's herding the people of Uruk mm -hmm. in the way he wants them to go, right? We tend to, sheep are, you know, meek, weak-willed creatures, not especially intelligent. Um, and, you know, they kind of need someone to keep them in line. So he is, but the shepherd isn't just supposed to keep the flock in line, right? <laughs> yeah, he's supposed to protect them and provide for them. So this is the people's shepherd. Bold, superb, accomplished, and mature. Are we supposed to read this as seri uh, serious or sarcastic? Sarcastic. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is sarcastic. This is meant to be ironic, right? Because clearly Gilgamesh doesn't really give a crap about anyone apart from himself. His own needs, his own desires, he fulfills as he pleases without worrying too much about the welfare of his people. So he may be, an, a, you know, he may be a great warrior. He may be a great player of some ancient Babylonian game. He may be very prolific with the ladies. But he is not a good king. He is ignoring his responsibilities as ruler. So what is the solution? To the problem. To make another man just as equal. Yeah. Let's create somebody else. Let's create somebody who is just as strong as Gilgamesh is. who can take him head on, and who can rein him in. So we have our wild man in Kidu, formed out on the steps, right out on the grasslands, outside the city, created by the mother goddess Aruru. When Aruru heard this, page 40, she conceived within her what Anu commanded. Aruru wet her hands. She pinched off clay. She tossed it upon the step. She created Valiant and Kidu on the step, offspring of potter's clay with the force of the hero Ninurta. Shaggy with hair was his whole body. His head was made lush with head hair like a woman. The locks of his hair grew thick as a grain field. He knew neither people nor inhabited land. He dressed as animals do. Now, he dressed as animals do. What does that mean? Yeah, he didn't wear any clothes. He didn't dress at all. Right? So even, you know, in translation, these ancient poets sometimes make little witticisms that, uh, you know, you can catch if you're careful and you read slowly. He fed on grass with gazelles. With beasts, he jostled at the water hole. With wildlife, he drank his fill of water. So here we have, opposed to the wild bull of Uruk, Right, rampaging around in his enclosure, the city of Uruk, this wild man, this man of the steppes, and is Enkidu actually equal to Gilgamesh? When they do actually come together, who wins? Gilgamesh. Uh, 
at this point in time, when he's still in the wild, man, he's Gilgamesh is equal. But. Yes, when he's still out in the wild, he probably could have taken Gilgamesh on, right? Yeah. But what has happened in between? Yes. <laughs> he, he's yes. Exposed to civilization. Exactly. He's exposed to civilization. Yeah, and I think the the process here is important, right? Um, pants are part of it. Pants are a very important part of it, right? You know, his powers are robbed by by pants. <laughs> More specifically, how is his power taken from him? How is his strength stripped away? when the girl um, strips in front of him and like mm -hmm. kind of seduces him. Yeah, and Kidu has no knowledge of other human beings, right? He knows nothing about other people. He's been spotted by a hunter, but he doesn't know what he is, right? He doesn't know what he himself is. He's never seen another person, never spoken to another person. So his first human encounter is with this woman, Shamhat, right, described in the poem as Shamhat the harlot. And in fact, the name Shamhat in Babylonian actually translates to giver of joy. <laughs> but one thing to, to note here is, you know, that the poem describes her as, you know, Shamhat the harlot, but we're not talking here about um, a simple prostitute, right? She's not a streetwalker. Um, ancient Babylonian religion um, was largely based on, uh, you know, fertility, right? Keeping the land fertile, keeping the people fertile, ensuring that the crops continue to grow, and ensuring that the people continue to reproduce. So the goddess of paradoxically both war and sexuality, um, was called Ishtar. And Ishtar's priestesses practiced prostitution. So Shamhat is not simply a prostitute. She is a priestess of the goddess, essentially the goddess of love and war. So, you know, she is, you know, she has, you know, particular sacred duty, like it's regarded as a kind of sacred duty. And if we look at what happens here when she meets Enkidu, the way this is described, right? Page 42, Shamhat loosened her garments, she exposed her loins, he took her charms, she was not bashful, she took his vitality. She tossed aside her clothing and he lay upon her. She treated him a human to woman's work. As in his ardor he caressed her, six days, seven nights was Enkidu aroused, flowing into Shamhat. So what is it that she took from him? Vitality. Yeah, she took his vitality. Now, this is in part, you know, a sort of like slightly bawdy little euphemism, but the broader point here is that she takes some element of his life force away. She takes some element of his strength away. He is not as mighty as he was after this encounter. He set off towards his beasts. When they saw him, and Kidu, the gazelle shied off. The wild beast of the steppe shunned his person. And Kidu had spent himself, his body was limp. His knees stood still while his beasts went away. And Kidu was too slow. He could not run as before. But he had gained reason and expanded his understanding. So how is Enkidu changed now? How is he different from what he was when Shamhat found him? More human-like. Why would you say more human-like, Daniel? Uh, because uh, in the beginning it's described as um, that he's obviously a beast, but then mm -hmm. after... Yep, he's naked, he's hairy, yeah, he drinks with the beasts, yeah. After um, Shamhat like, seduces him or whatever, he seems to become more of a human figure. Yeah, human contact changes him, right? Yeah. First thing that seems to happen to him is what? What's the fir what's first important change? 
He goes off to his animal friends, and what happens? Yep, they don't want anything to do with him. They won't come near him. It's like, you know, have, did your mother ever tell you, like, you know, don't pick up a baby bird because then, you know, the mother will smell human on it and not come back? That's not actually true. The reason the mother doesn't come back is because you moved the baby bird, and now she doesn't know where the hell it is. <laughs> um, I, I, I was, uh, I studied in Ireland uh, for a little while, and there's a, there's a park um, about an hour south of Dublin. It's called Glendalough, and there are all these wild goats that wander around through the park. And you'll, you'll sometimes see, you know, baby goats just sitting around in various positions around the park, not moving. And there are all these signs that say, please don't move the baby goats, right? They're not in trouble. The mother goat knows where it is. If you move the baby goat, she will not be able to find it. So just don't touch it. They're fine. So just so you know, that's why you should not go picking up baby birds or baby goats. <laughs> But the beasts here do seem to smell human on Enkidu now, right? It's like, no, you're different now. You're not like us anymore. You're no longer one of us. You're one of them. You're one of those, you're one of those two legs that come around and try to kill us. And what else has happened? When he tries to run after the beasts, what does he find? He can't run them. Yeah, he can no longer run like the gazelles, right? <laughs> He is no longer as fast, he is no longer as strong. But, what's the trade-off? Yeah, he can think now. He has gained reason and understanding. And so he's going to sit at Shamhat's feet and learn how to be human. Right, so what then does she do for him? How does Enkidu learn to be human? Well, she takes him to where other people are. Yeah, she takes him to the shepherds first, right? It's like, yeah, before we take you to your ultimate confrontation, you know, to, to, before I take you to meet Gilgamesh, let's sort of ease you into human society a little bit. We'll spend some time with some shepherds. What does she do before she even takes him to the shepherds? She him. Yeah, this is where Enkidu acquires his pants, right? <laughs> Although, like, really, like, um, you know, ancient Mesopotamian men didn't wear pants; they wore something more like a kilt. But, you know, pants, you know, that suffices, right? So, first step in humanization. Right, was human contact, in particular sexual contact. Second step, clothing. Right? Human beings, she tells him, cover up their nakedness. Right? They don't just wander around letting everybody see everything. He heard what she said, accepted her words. He was yearning for one to know his heart a friend. The counsel of Shamhat touched his heart. She took off her clothing with one piece she dressed him, the second she herself put on. Clasping his hand like a guardian deity, she led him to the shepherd's huts where a sheepfold was. The shepherds crowded around him. They murmured their opinions among themselves. This fellow how like Gilgamesh in stature, in stature tall, proud as a battlement. No. Whoever's that is, please. Uh, Turn it off for silence and thank you. No doubt he was born in the steppe like the force of heaven, mighty is his strength. They set bread before him, they set beer before him. He looked uncertainly, then stared, and Keita did not know how to, be, how to eat bread, nor had he ever learned to drink beer. So what's the significance here of bread and beer? What has he spent his whole life eating and drinking? Grass and water, Grass and water yeah. He is eaten like a beast. He is eaten like an animal. So why are bread and beer 
so important to his transformation into a human being? Why does he need to learn to eat these things? Well, bread and beer are both uh, <clears throat> agricultural products. There's typically not enough wheat in one area to make both. Uh -huh. There's also a fun little theory that beer is actually the tall civilization. Because um, uh -huh. you continue brewing the beer, right. they had to gather in the areas where they could grow wheat. Uh -huh. And the, the wheat farms led to the, the villages and towns and the civilization. Uh huh. And I mean, one thing to say too about ancient Middle Eastern beer, and you know, um, <laughs> beer is the, the earliest beer recipes come from Mesopotamia, from Egypt, and it was actually it was a dietary staple. Um, it was very low alcohol, and it was more like a soup than like uh, say Budweiser, which is more like water with rice in it. Um, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, I think, yeah, you're, you're right, Zach. Yeah, the, the important thing here is that these are products of human industry, products of human activity, right? You don't just find rivers of beer running through the wilderness, if only you did. Um, you don't find bread growing on trees, right? You have to harvest the wheat. You have to grind the wheat into flour. Then you have to you know, add water and bake it, right? So there's a lot of act, there, you know, there, there's a lot of activity necessary. I hear something buzzing. If whoever that is could please turn it off. Okay. So I'll leave you to figure it out. But yeah, bread and beer require human industry. So these are specifically human foodstuffs. Animals don't eat this. You know, don't give your dog beer. It's not a good idea. Animals don't eat bread and beer. And Kidu ate the bread until he was sated. He drank seven juglets of the beer. His mood became relaxed. He was singing joyously. He felt lighthearted and his features glowed. He treated his hairy body with water. He anointed himself with oil, turned into a man. So what's the final step in his transformation here? What finally turns him into a man? Yeah. A bath. <laughs> you have to be clean. You have to anoint yourself with oil. And then, then you are truly human, truly civilized. Right? This is what barbarians who live out in the wilderness don't do. They don't wash. So every time somebody takes a bath in this epic, pay attention. Because a bath usually indicates a change of state. The character is not the same after the bath as he was before. This is the first time we see it. We will see this, we will see this motif recur three or four times over the course of the epic. So once Enkidu and Gilgamesh meet, right, we see that Enkidu loses to Gilgamesh in their wrestling match. If they are supposed to be evenly matched, right, why is he lost? Because he's human. Yeah, he's weaker now. He was created as Gilgamesh's equal, but since his encounter with Shamhat, he is no longer equal to Gilgamesh. He's now weaker and will take on a subordinate role, right? He becomes Gilgamesh's sidekick rather than the nemesis he was intended to be. Now, who is it that set all of these events in motion? Who, set, well, who sent Shamhat out into the wilderness in the first place? Oh, Gilgamesh sent Yeah, Gilgamesh sent her. Because the hunter asked for somebody to tame this wild man, right? Yeah. She's there because Gilgamesh sent her. So Gilgamesh has unknowingly, but you know, fortunately for himself, already tamed his rival by sending Shamhat out to civilize him. 
All right, so now Gilgamesh and Enkidu are friends, right? And they're traveling together. They're going along together. They're hanging out together all the time. And Gilgamesh gets it into his head that they need to go to Lebanon to cut down this forest of cedars. Were you able to get any sense of where this idea comes from? Why he's decided to cut down this forest of cedars and, you know, slay or defy the guardian of this forest, this creature called Humbaba? He's desperate, he's desperate to come here and preserve the mortality. Is Gilgamesh worried about his mortality yet? That'll come. That'll come in time. No, not his mortality. He, he wants to make sure that his name lives. For, for yeah. Million. The goal is glory, right? Yeah. Right? If we look at, say, you know, and I'm going to ask you to excuse immediately my, you know, the general shittiness of my artwork. Um, so here's, you know, sort of a map of the general reason, re region we're dealing with. It. So here's the Arabian Peninsula. Here is um, Iraq, Turkey. So I, I know that it's not really shaped like this, but just bear with me for a moment. So generally speaking, the city Gilgamesh comes from, Uruk, is over here in southern Iraq. Lebanon, where the forest of cedars is, is somewhere over here. So are they all that close together? Yeah, so Humbaba, this creature, doesn't represent any threat. Yeah, no, it's the exact, yeah, this is some distance away. He's not bothering the city of Uruk. There's no real reason Gilgamesh needs to go out here to defend his people, right? Supposed to be the king's role. So, he's made this decision that they're going to go out, they're going to troop out there together and they're going to cut down the trees to make a new temple door. And Kidu made ready to speak on page 48, saying to Gilgamesh, My friend, I knew that country. When I roamed with the wild beasts, the forest is 60 double leaves in every direction. Who can go into it? Humbaba's cry is the roar of a deluge. His maw is fire. His breath is death. Why do you want to do this? The haunt of Humbaba is a hopeless quest. Gilgamesh made ready to speak, saying to Enkidu, I must go up to the mountain forest. I must cut a cedar tree. That cedar must be big enough to make whirlwinds when it falls. Right. I am gonna, I'm not just going to cut down a tree. I am going to cut down the biggest damn tree in that forest. Right, as a way of just, you know, like Gilgamesh was here in Lebanon, killing your monster and taking your trees. And Kidu made ready to speak, saying to Gilgamesh, How shall the likes of us go to the forest of cedars, my friend? In order to safeguard the forest of cedars, and Lil has appointed him to terrify the people, and Lil has destined him seven fearsome glories. That journey is not to be undertaken. That creature is not to be looked upon. The guardian of the the guardian of we don't know the forest of cedars, whom Baba's cry is the roar of a deluge. His maw is fire. His breath is death. But you've probably noticed there's a lot of repetition of specific phrases and even certain little episodes in the epic. Does anybody know why that is? Exactly. It's what it points to is the roots of the epic in the oral tradition. Right? This originated as what's called oral formulaic poetry. Right now, <clears throat> ancient poets in pre-literate societies didn't necessarily memorize a whole epic, but they would sort of repeat certain stock phrases 
and they would memorize sort of the outline of particular episodes and then improvise around them. Now, by the time this version of Gilgamesh is set down, um, it's become a literary tradition rather than an oral tradition, right? It's, you know, this isn't the first, the earliest written version of this myth. But it's still showing in the way the scribe copies it down its roots in oral formulaic poetry. Most epic <coughs> originates in oral tradition. Does everybody know, by the way, what we mean by epic, what an epic is, what characteristics an epic has? Just as a sort of mild digression here. A couple of you are nodding. Okay. Like a Do you care to share? Of somebody. Mm, not necessarily a downfall. Do they always follow the hero's journey, or is that just most the one we read about? Well, you know, there are some, particularly certain myth scholars of the mid 20th century, yeah, but... said that there is that myth pattern, that that pattern that all hero myths follow. Yeah. Um, but in order to um, try to put every myth into the same pattern, you no, have to do a lot of stretching. Not every myth, but every, every epic piece of epic poetry I believe, I've ever studied has yeah. had the same general flow to it. Yeah, we're usually, yeah, we are usually looking at a culture hero of some sort. And he is usually in some way superhuman, right? Yeah. He could be like Gilgamesh, a demigod, or like, you know, Achilles in the Iliad is, you know, his mother is a goddess, and so, you know, his skin is invulnerable, except for that one little weak spot. Or, you know, um, Beowulf, you know, in the, the old English epic. Um, you know, he's not a demigod, he's not divine in any way, but he does have superhuman strength and endurance, right? He's stronger than any other man. So, yeah, the central figure in an epic is usually some kind of Superman. Somebody who is way bigger than life. What else? Like what what else what other features does an epic typically have? Faith. Oh. There's usually uh, intervention by the gods. Okay, yeah, we have we have gods running around all over the place. Divine intervention. Um fate is a big deal in the Greek epics. Um, it's not something that really goes across cultures too much. It's a big deal in the Greek epics, and it's a big deal in some of the Norse and Anglo-Saxon stuff, just uh, for culturally specific reasons. It's not really a big deal in a, an epic like Gilgamesh, except, of course, that it's the fate of all human beings to die. An epic is also, you know, typically, you know, quite lengthy, And they often involve some story of, uh, like often a kind of nation building narrative. Right? At the very least, it involves, you know, sort of the hero laying the foundations for or saving. the culture that he's born into, sometimes creating an altogether new culture. Yeah, there is often an element of nationalism that creeps into the epic. In a lot of ways, um, it is in that way uh, kind of a conservative art form um, in that it often promotes a particular idea of nationhood um, that is based on kin, largely on you know, uh, kinship ties. <laughs> so this is what an epic is. Um, another feature that is common to epic is it usually begins with a kind of argument that presents the major themes and issues of the epic in miniature. Right, so say often like the first several, the first several stanzas in any given epic will often give you this kind of little thumbnail sketch 
of what the epic is going to be about. The Greek, the Greek epics also often to, uh, tend to begin with an invocation to the goddesses of the arts, an invocation to the muses, right? You know, oh muse, descend upon me and touch mine pen that I might uh, more effusively praise thine beauties and so on and so forth, yeah? That's a tradition that actually makes it into um, sort of more artificial English epics of the Renaissance and later, but that's not something that we're really gonna deal with so much. But yeah, there is a sort of argument here in Gilgamesh, right, at the very beginning of the poem, he who saw the wellspring, the foundations of the land, who knew the ways was wise in all things. Gilgamesh who saw the wellspring, the foundations of the land, he knew the ways was wise in all things. He it was who inspected holy places everywhere. Full understanding of it all he gained. He saw what was secret and revealed what was hidden. He brought back tidings from before the flood. From a distant journey came home weary at peace engraved all his hardships on a monument of stone. He built the walls of ramparted Uruk, the lustrous treasury of Halodiana. Now, does this sound like the Gilgamesh we're introduced to when he first actually appears? Bless you. Does the Gilgamesh who first appears running around like a wild bull in Uruk look anything like this guy who is wise in all things? who has inspected all the holy places and built the walls and brought back tidings from before the flood. No, 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 no. This is, what we're getting here is a picture of what Gilgamesh is going to look like at the end of the epic, right? This is what is going to happen to him. This is his character arc. So he's going to go from this aggressive, arrogant, spoiled king into a wise monarch who is at peace with himself. And part of that process is his friendship with Enkidu. So this is one thing that I do want you thinking about. <coughs> Let's see, how, where are we for time? <laughs> frozen, have we? All right. Um, here we go. Okay, we've got plenty of time. I do want you thinking about the extent to which Enkidu does fulfill his intended purpose. Balancing Gilgamesh out. But here, as they are about to go off and face Humbaba, and Kidu is the voice of caution, right? The guy who was the wild man not too long ago says, eh, you know, maybe this is not such a great idea. Humbaba is really strong. <coughs> um, the cedar forest is very far away. It's dangerous. We're probably going to get lost. Maybe this is not such a great idea. And Gilgamesh responds on page 49, Why, my friend, do you raise such unworthy objections? Who, my friend, can go up to heaven? The gods dwell forever in the sun. People's days are numbered. Whatever they attempt is a puff of air. Here you are, even you, afraid of death. What has become of your bravery's might? I will go before you. You can call out to me, go on, be not afraid. If I fall on the way, I'll establish my name, Gilgamesh, who joined battle with fierce Humbaba, they'll say. So Gilgamesh is calling out Enkidu as a coward here, right? Who cares if we're killed so long as we die gloriously? Only the gods get to live forever. The only immortality for human beings, the only immortality for mortals, is to leave behind a glorious name. Right? And if we succeed, think about how people are going to treat us, right? Think about the fame that we will get from our success. So they go off to the cedar forest, they fight Humbaba, 
And when they've got Humbaba at their mercy, who is it that demands they show him no mercy? Who, who is it that demands that Humbaba die? Yeah, and Kidu's the one who says, finish him off. And Kidu, who hadn't wanted to go in the first place, and Kidu, who until recently had been innocently roaming the steps, not bothering anyone, except the hunter, unknowingly. And Kidu is the one who demands that they kill this monster here and now. What has happened to Enkidu? Has Enkidu made Gilgamesh better or reigned Gilgamesh in as he was supposed to? I don't think Enkidu suddenly showing up is what gave him the idea. No. Yeah, the, on the one hand, at least, you know, he's, you know, with Enkidu going off on that, this epic adventure with him, right, at least they're not bothering the people of Uruk. So, okay, maybe that's an answer to their prayers, right? Yay, Gilgamesh is going away for a while. I think it made Gilgamesh better because in the end he's the one who kills him, so he gets kind of the glory for it. He does get the glory for it, right? It does egg Gilgamesh on to glory. Mm -hmm. Although that does bring up an interesting question. There's no other civilizations or other people at all in reference to, reference to this epic other than Ur, and, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, Ur is actually the first. The one, oh, one of the first. The first is actually, uh, the earlier city is Ur, actually, yeah. and then Uruk is founded later. Yeah. But Same civilization. Gilgamesh is the king of this place, mm -hmm. the most important person in this place. He can already do whatever he wants. Yeah. So what exactly is going to change about him if he gets all this glory? Why is he so obsessed with all this glory? There's no one left to impress. He's uh -huh. impressed everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that, that is actually an excellent point. What does he gain I mean, I, I can't by getting extra glory? Another professor mm -hmm. who was discussing Gilgamesh, that the idea was that Gilgamesh had some kind of grievance with the gods or he wanted to prove that he was good enough to be one of them or whatever, or something mm -hmm. like that. And I, I think that, that comes out a little bit more in the second half of the epic. Yeah. Um, but like, one thing to remember about... Uh, by and large, about Mesopotamian gods, um, and this is true of a lot of early uh, fertility religions, um, people didn't so much worship them as appease them. Right? The most powerful god in most ancient pantheons was the storm god. Because if he's in a good mood, he will send you healing rains right, that will water your crops, and you'll grow plenty of wheat that year, and everyone will eat, right? And everything will be great. If the storm god is angry with you, he will send floods. Um, he will send torrential downpours. He will send all sorts of nasty weather that will destroy your crops. So the way people tended to deal with the gods was simply just to try to keep them happy, right? We give them offerings of food, we give them offerings of beer, we give them offerings of various kinds of treasure, and you know, we sing hymns in, their pray, hymns in their praise so that they don't destroy us. This is the way most of the Mesopotamian gods typically behave. This will become more important um, as we look at the second half of the epic. But yeah, just so, just, you know, come to ex expect that. This, these are the ranks by the, the Gilgamesh wants to join. So in a lot of ways, in the early half of the epic, he's behaving more like a god than he is like a man who can just do whatever he wants and has to be appeased by the people. But yeah, so yeah, I mean, you are correct in noting that Gilgamesh as a character up to this point has not changed very much. He's just doing the same things he always does someplace else. So who has been through a process of change? And Kidu has. 
And has he changed for the better? Has being civilized actually been good for Enkidu? Has it made him better? No. Yeah, he's worse off physically, right? He's now weaker, and he's subordinate to the guy he was supposed to come and subdue. And has being civilized made him any nicer? Yeah. He's actually become more vicious, thanks to Gilgamesh's influence. Mm -hmm. What it basically boils down to is this is why we're so great, and these other people here are completely evil. <laughs> uh huh. But this one, Enkidu was better off, much better off, considering what happens later. Sure. As the barbarian mm -hmm. than he was as the part of humanity or yes. civilization. Yes. Enkidu would have lived a much happier life overall, and probably a longer one had Shamhat the harlot never come out to his little grassland home, right? He doesn't really gain in any meaningful material way from the relationship with Gilgamesh. But again, you know, just as the plot makes him into Gilgamesh's subordinate, right? The whole myth makes Enkidu into Gilgamesh's subordinate. There would be no reason for Enkidu to exist if there were no Gilgamesh. He is created solely to affect Gilgamesh in some way. But at least at first we see Gilgamesh having a bigger effect on Enkidu than Enkidu does on Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is happier. Yay, I have a best friend. But it hasn't changed his behavior at all. Exposure to civilization, on the other hand, has made Enkidu more brutal than he was as a barbarian. Okay, so I have been doing a lot of talking here. What questions do you guys have about this? Is there anything that confused you or that particularly interested you? Anything you didn't understand? Anything you want to understand a little better? See a tentative hand up back there. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so on page, it says, it says the elders, um, when they're talking to Gilgamesh, when he's trying to get their blessing to go uh -huh. to Humbaba. Humbaba, um, yes. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, they refer to, and, like it says, grave husband. They refer mm -hmm. to you as a grave husband. So, but. Yes. Um, it says, like, the phrase seems to portend uh, Enkidu's death, but they're not talking about. His death during the battle mm -hmm. between Humba. between whom? But no, Enkidu does not die in this fight, and the elders are not um, referring specifically to um, Enkidu's death in that battle. They're not predicting he's going to die then. In fact, I mean, this is actually just a little bit of a sort of you know foreshadowing joke on the part of the poet. Um, on the one hand, you know, he will turn to be a grave husband, you know, a sober, serious adult who can provide good counsel. But a grave husband, he can return to be a dead man, eventually. Um, and Kidu is going to die in the second part of the epic. And his death is actually probably the single most important thing that happens in the epic for various reasons that we'll get to next time. But yeah, this is, yeah, this grave husband is a little foreshadowing joke. It's like, it, like it, it's an ancient, it's kind of an ancient Babylonian pun. What else? It's not so the poem, but about the, uh, the Gilgamesh and Enkidu being the same material. Yeah. Uh, I'm noticing a lot of very, a lot of connections with uh, Christian stories. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember reading uh, Beowulf 
where there's explicit references to God. Yes. But those came from the monks rewriting it and including it, putting it. Uh, Putting those references in. Right. In Beowulf, there's a lot of tension between the older pagan world it depicts and the Christian world it's Which, written in. Yeah. Well, that probably wasn't actually there in Beowulf. Anyway. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it's the same situation with Gilgamesh or if it's a different situation, whereas the Christian, the Christian uh, stories were, uh, came from these stories. Well, Which probably isn't the question yeah. In and it's, it's, it's not necessarily that um, the uh, you know sort of Christian or Hebrew stories came directly from stories in Gilgamesh. They may in fact actually come from a common older root. See, um, the people who became the Israelites, if we remember our little uh, our crappy map here, let's just go let's just let's just say that this is the basic shape of Iraq, right? And Uruk is somewhere around here. The nomadic people who became the Israelites originally came from sort of somewhere around here. So we're talking about the same part of the world. Well, yeah, that's why so, I wonder, yeah. wonder if, if the references to the Christian-like things mm -hmm. were actually there as part of the quote unquote original story Oh, oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, these are things that are on the tablets. Oh. Um, yeah, um, the the Gilgamesh tablets uh, predate yeah. Christianity by uh, and even you know Judaism by centuries. Uh, that was just mm -hmm. No, you're, you're, yeah, you're right. There are there are strong similarities. The, the, the importance of bathing, for example, you know, and a, the bath indicating a change in status, uh, being uh, like baptism. Um, what caught my attention was uh, there's, when Enkidu is becoming human, mm -hmm. there's kind of this undercurrent of knowledge of evil, like the same with the, uh, uh, the Adam and Eve story, where he didn't right. know that anything was wrong with him until someone told him. Mm -hmm. He didn't know that he needed to wear pants until he was told, and then right. he becomes significantly after. It's a loss of innocence, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, you, you had your hand up for a while. You've been yeah, patient. Um, I wanted to say, to the point of um, Enkudu being more vicious, sure. um, like, Mbumbaba is like pretty much begging for his life. Uh -huh. Like, he pretty much is saying, like, spare my life. And then that's when Enkudu says, like, just go ahead and kill him. But uh -huh. I'm like, I was wondering if, if they ended up sparing his life, do you think um, Mbaba would have been more of like more willing to like work with Gilgamesh or like not be enemies or? Well, it, it would it would become a different kind of myth then, right? It would become a a taming the monster myth, yeah, rather than a slaying the monster myth. More enemies than Gilgamesh ever showed up in his house. No, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there, there's no, there's no real, there's no real reason for Gilgamesh to be in Humbaba's forest, other than that he wants to, you know, he wants to carve his name into the big tree, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, because that's essentially what I thought was going to happen, like, at, at yeah, the that right, that that you know, he 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 tames this beast, he tames this natural force. Yeah and then is able to make it work for him. And I think, you know, that would be, like, if Gilgamesh were already at a more advanced state of wisdom or spirituality when this occurs, that might be the kind of myth, like, I am going to tame you to benefit my people. But Gilgamesh is not thinking yet about the benefit to his people. He's thinking only about the benefit to himself. And he's like, if I kill Humbaba, I can chase down and gain his seven glories, right? These seven magic powers that the gods have given to him. And I can go cut down that tree I wanted. So yeah, it would be, it would be a very different kind of myth. But yeah, yeah, that's actually a good call. Yeah, Katarina. Can we talk about the dreams? Sure, what do you want to know about the dreams? Um, to me, it seems like Gil Gilgamesh is the one dreaming, right? Gilgamesh does a lot of dreaming. Okay. And then Ankudu is the one who explains his dream, mm -hmm. but it's not Gilgamesh. 
So Gilgamesh was like, I had a disturbing dream. Why does Anshu uh -huh. explain it then? I think part of it has to do with um, Enkidu's role in the myth at this point is being primarily a helper or sidekick, right? Um, the hero is the one who gets to have the important prophetic dream. And yeah, it's the role of the sidekick simply to help out by explaining it. Um, it is weird that the person who is newer to civilization um, and you know, newer to human arts would have this um, incredible knowledge of divination and you know, dream interpretation. But yeah, I think it, it's just it's reinforcing Enkidu's role as the subordinate character. Okay, and then having to always um, go back to taking a bite and going to their camp, back to Mount Lebanon, is that just part of being an epic? Too? Yeah, it's it's just it's it's a build up okay. to the to the confrontation. It's it, and yeah, you you, you probably noticed there again that this scene and the language repeats over like this particular tablet is for me the longest, hardest slog. Yeah, it kind of annoyed me. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's probably supposed to uh, sort of, you know, you know, whet your appetite for the confrontation. And it, it's, it was, probably would have been part of the oral poet's arsenal to keep his audience waiting. Okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the best I can do on that. What else? Yeah, Kayla. Um, another thing about the dreams is sometimes Gilgamesh doesn't even get to explain what happened in his dreams, mm -hmm. and he just already knows how to interpret that. Are yeah. we supposed to just kind of ignore it, or? Well, give me an example. Um, <laughs> on page fifty-four. Okay, fifty-four. Um, he says, "My friend, did you not call me? Why am I awake? Did you not touch me? Why am I disturbed? Did a god not pass by? Why does my flesh tingle? My friend, I had a dream." And the dream I had was very disturbing. Uh -huh. and, yeah, the one born in the step, Enkidu, explained the dream to his friend. And he goes on and explains what happened in the dream without Gilgamesh explaining his dream to him. Are we supposed to say no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't... Um, yeah, I, I guess... Um, Right, yeah, <laughs> you're right. He, the, the, dream, the dream itself is missing, and it doesn't look like... Usually we can see the points where the tablets are damaged um, and the words are unreadable or untranslatable. Like, by these little, you know, you get these brackets and the little ellipses inside it. What this indicates is what's called a lacuna. And a lacuna is basically a hole or a gap in the manuscript. And these are either because of the state of the tablets or because it's, you know, our understanding of ancient Mesopotamian languages is still incomplete. So sometimes there are words that we simply just don't know how to translate yet. Uh, maybe there are words that, you know, don't occur in any other Mesopotamian text that we know of. Um, but that doesn't seem to be what happened here. That happens a couple of times too, I think. Yeah, it's it's it seems yeah like it it just cuts off there, and I don't really I don't really know what to say about that. Um, I don't really know um, how to answer that except that I I don't think that the specific description of the dream is probably all that important. Mm -hmm. But you're it is weird. Sorry, I can't be more helpful. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Wish I could. I wish I understood it. <laughs> All right, anything else? What else do you guys want to talk about? What else do you want to know about? Anybody got anything? All right, we are about out of time, so let me give you reading questions for next time. And just so you guys are aware, by the way, um, I got a few email questions about this. Um, the reading questions, um, you're not required to write out answers to these and turn them in. These are here just sort of to help you uh, with the test. Right, if you're confused about something or if you're having trouble generating ideas, these are to help kind of spur your brain a little bit.
you're not required to formally answer them and turn them in. So, um, right, if you have one of these little sheets and haven't turned it in, um, please do so. Um, do please feel free to take a flyer for the philosophy thing if you're interested. Um, and I will see you all on Tuesday.